G'day everyone, how are you guys doing? That's, that's good. So this is the last session before you guys get your new toys, I mean Android development devices, right? That's what you're going to use them for, right? So we're going to make sure we finish on time and you guys can rush down and get, pick them up. So the good thing is we're not too far from the elevators, so you'll be able to get down. My name is Anka Cotwell, and I'm an Android developer advocate from Sydney, Australia. I'm also joined today by some uh, friends and colleagues, Tony Chan from, from Hong Kong, and Tim Bray from Vancouver, Canada. So you'll see we have a very global panel here today, and I hope that uh, you find what we're presenting to not just be interesting, but our aim is so that it plants that seed in your mind that makes you want to build innovating, innovative, and fun experiences for your users. So today, we're going to talk about sensors, and not those types of sensors that rate movies or silence their critics. We're talking about the pieces of hardware in your Android devices that provide you with useful information that you can't get from traditional computing devices like laptops or, tablet, uh, or desktop computers. So we're going to start off by showing you a demo that we've built. So let's switch over. Oh, pardon me. Yep. Have we got them the right screen? Just waiting for it to switch. OK. So we've built a game of blackjack. And we thought, how can we push the envelope? Let's use four Nexus 7 devices. Right? Um, with blackjack, it's typically dealer versus player. They're not, you're not competing against one another just against the casino. And the aim of the game is to have your cards tally to 21, or as close to 21 as you can get without exceeding it. So let's get started. We're gonna, I, I'm going to play the dealer. And you'll see I've got a deck of cards here. And on the right-hand side, I'm the, it's the dealer's cards. Uh, Tim and Tony have, have their round. So we're going to use a bunch of gestures and a bunch of sensors to actually simulate this demo. All right, so it says game started. What I'm going to do is deal one card to each of the players. So one to Tim, one to Tony, one to, to the dealer. Do another round of cards. I'm just going to space them out nicely. So right now it says it's Tim's turn. Tim, you're on 15. What would you like to do? Hit me, baby. Wait hit a second. You wrote the software, didn't you? <laughs> I did. So Tim said, hit me. What that means in blackjack is give me another card. And the way you signal that in a casino to a dealer is by tapping on your cards or on the table. So, uh, so Tim, could you please do that? One more time? <laughs> no. There we go. All right, so we're going to deal a card to, to Tim. And Tim, now you're on 20. What would you like to do? Oh, uh, I'll stand. You're going to stand. So stand in blackjack means I'm done. I'm happy with how many points I'm on. And Tim's on 20, he doesn't want to take a risk. So the way you do that in, in a casino is that you wave your hand over the cards. And you'll see that, that Tim's device said, you're done, you're on 20. It's told me to deal a card on my side to Tony. So Tony, uh, what would you like to do? Well, I'm on 11. I want to hit a blackjack, so um, hit me. OK, so there we go, came up on mine. Tony, you're on 18. Uh, Come on, take a gamble. No? No, I'm going to stay. stay. You're going to stand. All right, so Tony has stood on 18. Tim is on 20. The dealer has one card face up, one card face down. So we're going to flip the card. 19. Now, that's pretty good for the dealer. So I'm also going to just stand. And you'll see that that's the end of the round. So I, I was able to defeat Tony, and I was able Damn. to, I was unfortunately lost to Tim. How about we do one more round of that, guys? You OK with that? Well, I'm going to sit this one out. I saw your code, too, so. <laughs> You're saying it's rigged, Tony? That's fine. So it says Tony not playing. Tony just flipped his device. All right, Tim, it's just you and me. Let's have one more round. All right, here we go. One card to you, one card to dealer, one card to you, one card to me. What do you reckon, Tim? Hit you, all right. What do you want? 20. What would you like to do? 
You're standing. All right. Dealer's turn. Blackjack. <laughs> <laughs> he wrote the code, like I said. The moral of the exactly. story is that the casino always wins. All right. All right, let's switch back to the slides. So that was a fun little demo that we built. And what we want you to realize is that that demo didn't actually utilize the traditional layer of abstraction you get from a user interface. There were no buttons. We were trying to build a natural user interface to simulate a natural experience. And we did that using sensors. So let's look at which sensors and how we did it. First and foremost, touch, the touch screen. The great thing about the touch screen is that you automatically get these events passed to you. You don't need to ask for them. All you have to do in your code is override the onTouch event method. Now, on developer.android.com, there's a lot of information on how to process these, these motion events. And there are also third-party websites that have a lot, a lot of documentation for, for this. So you would think, oh, well, with all this information available, it's really easy, right? Not quite. There is a bit of a learning curve that's involved in, in processing this stuff. So that documentation, it helps. So once you know what you're doing, you can, you can really achieve things rapidly. But to start off with, it can be a little bit hard. So what I'd like to share with you is a couple of utility classes that we have in the framework that can help you. We use the gesture detector class in this sample to, to detect things like the tap. And all we had to do was pass our motion event objects to the gesture detector, and it would call back when one of those gestures had been fired off. We also use the velocity tracker to track that when I've lifted my finger after the swipe, what speed those cards needed to fly across at. So that was the velocity tra tracker. The next one is the gesture builder sample. This is a, a piece of open source code that we've made available on Google Code that allows you to detect or capture complex gestures, like drawing a plus symbol and then acting on it. Or something even more complicated is doing a spiral. So in a game, you might use that to cast a spell. So that sample there helps you capture that gesture and then detect it. We also have a blog post that goes with it, so it's really worth your while looking at it. What I'd like to share with you now is a recipe. So we did a multi-touch gesture to collect cards. We used five fingers and pulled it in, and it collected the cards from the players. Now what we're going to do is share a, an algorithm with you with some code. And you'll see with all of our recipes, the way it works is that we have a data gathering phase and a gesture detection phase. So this here is the data gathering phase. And the way it works is that we have a, an initial if condition that says, is there a gesture still in progress? Because the motion event tells us that, hey, you want to cancel the gesture or you want the last, the last finger has come off, so just reset your state. That's not what we're doing here. We're saying we're continuing. And what we do for this particular algorithm is two things. One is get an initial snapshot of all your fingers. And once we have that initial snapshot, we also then go and get a current snapshot. And as this method is invoked again and again, we keep updating that current snapshot. You have to start. Now, that, that's mm -hmm. the... Uh, the, the data gathering phase. Let's look at the gesture detection phase. What we do here is basically we, we go through and compare that initial snapshot and the current snapshot. So the way we do that is that we get our initial snapshot, or we do this for both snapshots. We work out what is the maximum distance between any two combinations of fingers, and we store that in our initial snapshot. We do the same thing for our current snapshot. And when the current snapshot is 30% or less than the initial snapshot, we consider the gesture as having been triggered. So initial snapshot, current snapshot. We can go the opposite way as well to say when our initial snapshot is 30% of the size or less than our current snapshot, we've gone a pinch out. So this is a very simple implementation of that particular gesture, but it worked quite well for our demo. There is a gotcha. And that gotcha is that we have used in our algorithm three fingers. We've said we only need to detect three fingers. Now, the reason for only three fingers is because as your fingers converge on a touch screen, the touch screen can stop seeing them as two skinny fingers and sometimes start to see them as one big fat finger when they're really close together. 
So you don't want to sit there waiting for five fingers because you may, may never hit your 30% threshold. So what we do is we say whenever we have three fingers or more, it's, valid, it's a valid precondition for our gesture detection phase. All right, so that's the multi-finger pinch. One of the other interesting things you would have seen today is that we had this wave gesture, and we did the stand. We just waved our hand over the top of the device. We didn't actually touch the screen at all, right? So you might be thinking, well, how, how did we do this? Most developers assume that we used the camera, and we didn't. We've used some other sensors. But before we talk about those, I want to talk about best practices when using sensors. See, the thing is, again, sensors and sensor manager is quite well documented in a variety of places. So what I want to share are the best practices. The first one is that when you request sensor data, you can actually specify how much or how often it should give that data back, the rate. And we have four stages or four rates that you can specify. You should not be tempted into asking data back at the fastest rate as possible. Because if you do, you end up like this guy. Data overload, what do I do with it? The sensor data doesn't necessarily mean that you have useful information. It is up to you as the developer to translate that. Now, the way you do that is using these different algorithms, right? But you want to make sure that you don't have too much data because the more data you have, the more effort is required by your app to process it, which means then if you're, if you're getting too much data, your app could be less responsive to that gesture because you're not processing it in time. The other thing you should look at is the, the, the unregister part of it. As soon as you can, you should unregister for that, for that listener, or for the sensor, sorry. And the reason for that is that, again, from an efficiency point of view, your app isn't sitting there processing all of this sensor data that's coming in when you're just either not using it or throwing it away. The other thing that, that happens from running these sensors nonstop is that you cause a drain on the battery. So suddenly, your app is now a bad citizen on a user's device. You never want that. All right, now that we've talked about this, let's go back to those telepathic gestures. The first sensor I want to talk about is the proximity sensor. The proximity sensor is typically found on, on phones, and what it's used for is that when someone's on a call, we put it up to our face, and we put the device up to our face, our, the, the proximity sensor turns off the screen so that our face isn't pressing buttons on the screen. You don't typically find it on tablets because people don't tend to make phone calls on these things, although I've seen some really large devices that make me feel otherwise. Different topic. So with a Galaxy Nexus, the maximum range of the proximity sensor is about five centimeters. So what that means is anything outside of five centimeters, it won't detect. It'll just say there's no obstruction. Proximity sensors can give data in gradual measurements, let's say like two centimeters or three centimeters, but many Android devices will actually give you data in a binary or an on-off state. There is an obstruction or there isn't. So again, from a best practices point of view, you want to assume that you're using binary data. Now, in terms of gestures, if we try and do a gesture where our hand moves in and out from the device and graph that, it looks a little bit like this graph here, where between zero and five centimeters, it's, I have an obstruction, the distance is zero centimeters, and above that, it's five. So proximity sensors, they're not so useful for detecting gestures. What is useful is a light sensor. The light sensor gives you the ambient, the measurement in lumens per square meters of your ambient light conditions. Now, if we look at the same gesture with a, an, uh, an ambient light sensor, move our hand in and out and graph that, what you'll see is a gradual drop as the hand comes in and then stays there and then goes back out. The cool thing about a, a light sensor, however, is that we can detect another type of gesture, which is the wave or the swipe. So if we graph that, you'll see that the, the drop in the graph is a lot more sudden, right? Because your hand covered the, the, there wasn't much opportunity where your hand was partially covering the light sensor. It pretty much is or it isn't. But you might be looking at that graph and saying, what's that weird spike on the right-hand side? Let me explain that. So when we did this, recorded this gesture, we used our fingers. 
and between the four fingers and the thumb, there is a gap. So what's happened is when the four fingers have swiped over the, the light sensor and gone past, light has bled through between the fingers and the thumb, and then the thumb has obscured it again, which is why you get that little drop. So in terms of comparing these two gestures, you have to look at the shape of the data or the shape of the graph. You need to do some analysis. What I'm going to show you now is the recipe that we used in the blackjack game for the swipe uh, or the stand gesture. What we do in the data gathering phase is literally just fill up a circular buffer. Our buffer is uh, its only 100 data points, um, but it's enough. And then every half a second, what we do is go through that circular buffer and work out the maximum light value, that light reading that we had from that buffer. And then we get the current value, and we compare them. If the current value is 20% or less of that maximum value, we consider the gesture as having been triggered. So, you know, initially our maximum value was like there's lots of light, and then suddenly there's a lot less light. We consider it triggered. This is a very simple and unsophisticated implementation, but for our demo it was sufficient. It also does not distinguish, this particular implementation does not distinguish between in and out and side to side. But as I said, it's, it's more than sufficient for what we were demoing. One last best practice that I'd like to tell you is that I initially talked about the proximity sensor. I said it's not really good for gesture detection, but what it is good for is gesture validation when you're using the light sensor. So one of the downsides to purely using the light sensor is that you are relying on consistent ambient lighting conditions. So if the user is using that app on a train or a bus, then as they go through a tunnel or go through the shadow of trees or, or buildings, those light conditions can change. And you don't want your gesture being incorrectly triggered then. So what you do is use the light sensor to detect the type of gesture and then use the proximity sensor to ensure that there was a hand or some sort of obstruction in front of the device. And then you can be sure, certain that it was an intentional gesture. Now with that, I'm going to hand it over to Tim. Thank you. Hey, how about a round of applause for that blackjack game that Anchor pulled together? <laughs> so, so I'm here to talk about motion-related stuff. And I would normally use the word gesture to describe that, but they took that word. Gestures is apparently now what you do on the screen and scribbles you make on the screen. So I had to think of a word, so I'm going to say uh, kinetics to mean anything motion related. And the core idea here is to have apps that you control without having any buttons or sliders or any other kind of thing. And you can imagine lots of different kinetic gestures you can make with, with phones and devices to control. This. We've seen some usage in the field of, of shake to undo, for example, but, but I think we can go a lot further than that. So what happened was I got an idea for an app that would need a lot of this stuff. And like I always do when I'm looking at a new Android app that I haven't used, a, a, a new Android API that I haven't used before, I just went out and typed it into Google and assumed you know, all the best practices would pop up on Stack Overflow and, and our own developer pages and so on. And I found more or less nothing. And that may be the real news story of this session here today, is not many people are doing this stuff. I found a few places where they told you how to detect a simple shake, but very, very little for detecting anything by way of more structured gestures. So the stuff, kind of stuff we're talking about here is just not being done that much out there. OK, so when I actually sat down to write the app, I uh, found that you know, there was a lot, there's a lot of data coming out of these things. They're throwing you know, triples of floating point numbers at you many, many times per second. And you need to sort of get a feel for what this data is. And so I wrote this app on, on Android Market called Sensplore, S-E-N-S-P-L-O-R-E. -S -S -E. It's there. And, and it gathers data. It's the simplest possible app you can imagine. You press a button, and then you shake the phone around to doing whatever you're doing. Then you press the button again. And it saves it out as a CSV file and emails you the CSV file. So then you drop that into a spreadsheet, and you can look at all the beautiful numbers coming out of the sensor and do things like draw graphs of them that you, that, like, like you see there on, on that device. So um, you know, I, some people said, well, why don't you just display the values on, on the screen of the device instead? And that doesn't work because, first of all, it's too small. And secondly, it's really hard to watch the screen while you're you know, shaking the device around. So um, you, you can grab this and run it and look at the graphs and so on. 
But uh, since this is a developer tool, you might find it handier to download the source from uh, code.google.com and hack it around to generate data out of the sensor you're interested in and make use of the stuff that's already in there for generating CSV and emailing it to you and, and that kind of stuff. OK, it's got a few other utility functions, too. So there are a lot of Kinetics-related sensors on your typical Android devices, and they've kind of trickled in over the years. So typically, a modern, high-end Android device is, not, is going to have a lot more than an older, cheaper device. Um, here is some timeline data. It, it's a little bit misleading. Just because something showed up in API Level 3 does not mean you can assume that it's there in every device Level 3 or higher. Some of these correspond directly to actual physical sensors on the device. Others are, are synthetic. In particular, the data coming out of the gyroscope is very accurate and very useful, but it doesn't come out in units that correspond very well to the way computer programmers think about how devices are moving around in space, unless, of course, they're PhDs in math who fully understand uh, the appropriate level of matrix algebra. So anyhow, so for that reason, there are three synthetic sensors in there, gravity, linear acceleration, and rotation. And they take the data coming out of the uh, uh, accelerometer and the gyroscope and combine it into something that's a little bit more uh, programmer friendly. Um, the good news is that these have gotten a lot better since ICS. The quality of the data that's coming out at you really is a lot better, but really only in devices that have a gyroscope. And just to make that realistic, here's uh, some graphs that I drew out of coming out of Sensplor of data, um, uh, some, some gestures I'll talk about. But the top one is the Galaxy Nexus, and the bottom one is the Nexus 1. And you can see, well, first of all, the data rate of the samples is different on the Nexus 1, even though I put the same argument in. And secondly, the data on the Nexus 1 is much less granular and much messier and sort of floppy and harder to deal with. It may be the case that for certain apps, you might want to probe for the presence of the gyroscope and, and, and decline to proceed without it. Um, OK, so let's talk about some of the data that you're coming at. You have to learn to think in terms of coordinate systems. The sensors typically, for the, the motion stuff, give you triples of floating point data. And it's really totally essential that you go and read the Java docs in detail, uh, which are all in the sensor event Java docs, because sometimes they are moving along the axes, and sometimes they're moving around the axes. And, some t and, and by the way, since we're all from Commonwealth countries, those would be the X, Y, and Z axes. Um, in, 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 in device coordinates, you know, uh, Z, uh, X is right, Y is up, and Z is towards you. Um, so another reason you have to read the Java docs is they don't always come out as X, Y, and Z. Some of them come out as Z, X, and Y, and there's no way to find that, out that without reading it. That corresponds to yaw, pitch, and roll, for those of you who are aeronautical engineers. Now, as far as I know, all the data coming out of the devices is in device coordinates, not world coordinates, where Y is north, X is east, and, and Z is coming out of the center of the Earth. Um, and that's OK for a lot of stuff. But if you want to do something like a compass, you really need to tr transform things into world coordinates. Now, you can do that because we've got a magnetic field sensor and a gravity sensor and so on. But it requires some really fairly advanced uh, uh, 3D rotation matrix math that I once knew, but then I forgot 15 minutes later. Uh, you know, quaternions and things like that. Fortunately, there's a lot of helper functions. One particular thing you've got to watch out for is that um, the, the, the device coordinate system is up as towards the top of the device. And when you turn it sideways into landscape mode, well, the device now has a different top, and all your data values change. You can actually see the readout change that gets past 45 degrees. And enough people have been screwed up by this that we actually wrote a whole great big long blog post about how to avoid getting screwed up by sensor rotation, because there's lots of ways you can try and fix it that don't work, and, and one that does. So, 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 so you should go and read this. Um, there's a bunch of other things to worry about. And probably you know, the primary thing is the one Ankara already mentioned, because doing this kind of programming is a really good way to burn the battery on, on your device. And it's not so much that the little tiny infinitesimal bit of silicon in there is burning power. It's that it, uh, um, it, it's that, uh, it calls back into your code 10, 20, 50, or more times a second. And this isn't a simple kind of callback where you increment an integer. You're typically passing in a bunch of floating point numbers and diving straight into the trigonometry library or doing you know, matrix inversions and multiplications and things like this. And you're typically doing it not on lightweight local variables, but on you know, sh uh, class variables that are full of shared state because you're you know, getting called back. So this is not lightweight computing. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that it's going to play hell with your battery. So what that means is um, you know, only sample as fast as you need to. And especially, 
you got to stop sampling when you don't need to anymore. So when your app gets an on pause event or you're passing, you know, something you've recognized off to client code, you got to turn off the turn off the sensors because the system won't and you'll sit there in the background with the sensors grinding and the battery going like this. So, so don't do this. Um, another thing to watch out for as you saw on that graph is the sampling rate uh, changes from device to device, so you actually have to look at and use the timestamp that comes in with a sensor event, which is irritatingly in nanoseconds, not milliseconds, and irritatingly not synchronized with the system time. Oh, well. Um, what else do you have to worry about? Oh, well, the, um, the, the, just the fact that the data is messy. These are not high-grade industrial uh, A to D converters that they use in steel mills and so on. These are flimsy little bits of silicon that are put into handsets by cost-conscious manufacturers, and the data is janky and messy and has variation and static, and, and you just have to deal with that fact. Uh, and one particular thing to watch out for is the, is the accelerometer. Now, the accelerometer is a cool device. There's this video you can see on YouTube as to how it's actually built. There are actually this little prong of silicon with the stuff underneath it etched away that is on a little thin stem, and it actually bends and changes, causes variations in the current. And there's three of these things facing in the three axes. And they measure the attractive forces, which obviously include battery, uh, gravity. And that means that the only time the accelerometer is giving you a zero readout is when the device is falling, or it's in orbit. One side effect of this is that if you take an Android device into orbit, all the games will immediately stop working because they you know, count on, on gravity <laughs> being there. So I said that Anker wrote all the code for the blackjack. Well, there was one piece I wrote, which was the thing where he flipped it up and, and the cards flipped over. So let's talk through that in detail and get a feel for how this kind of stuff works. So this graph here shows what happens when I take a Galaxy Nexus and I hold it facing me and I, I Chop, left, back, right, and forward. Simple, discrete chop motions. So what we're interested in here is obviously the last of those four motions, uh, chop forward. And so in the top graph shows the actual raw accelerometer data readout. The bottom graph shows a readout of the change in angle around the x, y, and z coordinates um, per sample. Um, I'll show you how you get that in a sec. And uh, it's easy to see by looking at the, the, the motion we're looking for is characterized by a sustained and fairly large uh, delta angle around the x coordinate in a negative direction because it's coming up towards you as opposed to going down. So that's the condition we're going to look for. So, so let's look at some of the code here. So once again, this is the best practice design pattern you see in sensor reading code. You always check the type of the sensor that you're getting the event for. And that allows you to pack all your different sensor handling code into one class, too, with a, with a case statement wrapped around it. So in this case, I'm going to handle the, uh, the, the rotation vector sensor, which is a synthetic sensor, again. And here's where we're going to do all the math. So we get these float arrays, which are three by three. And the central operation here compares two of them, uh, these two rotation matrices, to compute a change in angles. And you don't have to be a genius to figure out that it's probably a bad idea to allocate three by three floating point matrices 50 times a second. Um, you know, you, that's going to make your garbage collector super unhappy. So that flipper class there simply keeps two of them around and flips them back and forth so you have next and last. So what happens is the, we get called with a, with a vector of three arguments, and we call the library routine there to turn them into a matrix, and then we compare it to the last matrix, and that gives us the delta in angles and radians per, I have no idea what the units are, radians per something or other, uh, around, the, uh, around the z, x, and y axes. And then so we'd go and do some comparison. And because to, to deal with all the static, we've got some threshold values. And we establish two Booleans, minus x and plus x, depending on whether we've decided the, the device is rotating forwards or backwards around the x-axis. So then to dive into the code, so all the sensor code I've written ends up being a sort of a twisted state machine. I don't know, maybe some other technique will work better for you. Now, I say twisted because um, I require that the uh, device stay in a particular state for a certain amount of time. In particular, you know, you chop the device, then it settles down. So there's this state called being at rest, and I require that it stay there for a certain number of clicks before I'll start looking for new states. So this is pretty easy to see. So I, I, I sum up, I sum up uh, clicks for a while, and then I start looking, and you know, if it goes negative, I move into the going negative state, and if it goes positive, I move into the going positive state. And then if I'm in the positive going negative state, which is flipping up, and I require that it stay there for a certain amount of time, and then I detect the case that it's no longer in that state, and I decide that we've detected a flip-up event and dispatched to Anker's code to, to, turn, to, to turn the cards over. 
Um, you'll notice that when I do that dispatch, the first thing I do is instantly is unregister all my listeners so that the sensors are no longer running. And then I call his code, and if it returns true, I turn them back on, otherwise I don't. So that's, that's what it's like, down against the coal face of the sensors. Tony, you want to show that tilt app there? Sure. Um, so he here's a silly little app I wrote to, let's see if this works. Got to be vertical. Um, oops. Oh, well, maybe this isn't going to, oh, there it is. So, okay, uh, okay. It's, it shows this thing on the screen, and as, as Tony tilts back and forth, it keeps it level. It keeps the red line level as the device moves back and forth. Trust me, it looks cool. It's in the SenseFlow app, the code for it. Anyhow, so what we're trying to do is simply calculate, let's go back to the slides, which yeah. is one, two, two. Um, which, uh, hello, slides? It's yeah, so we're gonna just trying to calculate that angle theta to figure out how far we've slipped, and a little bit of trigonometry suffices, but there's some other interesting stuff in here. Um, so first of all, you have to be defensive. You know, you, you're computing the ratio between the value of, of gravity and the, and the component of that along the, the uh, vertical axis of the phone, and taking the arc cosine of that, and if you feed a number greater than one to math.arc cosine, it gets all unhappy and barfs at you. Uh, so you have to defend yourself against that. The other thing you have to watch out for is that, you know, the units coming out of the sensors may be non-intuitive, so there's a certain amount of adding and subtracting pi over two. And then um, the real problem I fought with in this thing is as the math routines get near the zero and come out the other side, they go non-linear sometimes, and you get weird variations. So you need a circular buffer in there that saves up some small number of samples. I think I used five. And so each time you get a new data point, you put it in there, it takes out the oldest one, and that returns you the average of all the ones that are in there. So that smooths out the curve a little bit. So this is the kind of defensive programming you have to do. Now one thing you'll notice is a lot of Android games, um, you hold the device like this, like this, flat like this, and, and, and you tilt it back and forth, and you know, your spacecraft goes right or left, or the ball rolls around, or something like that. The reason game developers love to do this, and, and the reason I recommend it, is you can use the accelerometer data almost directly. If you're holding it flat like this, if you think about it, the component of gravity is zero up both on this axis and that axis. And as you tilt it a little bit this way, it goes, you know, positive on this axis and, and negative, positive, negative. And it turns out you can use the values coming out of this almost directly, if you think about the math, as force values, which gives you acceleration values, and if you remember Newton's laws of motions, you can integrate and compute, you know, which way the space, where the spacecraft is, or where the little ball rolled to, or so on. There's a nice mathematical technique called Verlet integration, um, and there's this terrific sample in the, in the samples with the SDK that uses Verlet integration to track a bunch of little silver balls rolling around on a, uh, on a surface with an astoundingly small amount of code. Uh, very elegant, very, very good. Okay, so, so I, I advise you to get it. Now, if you're like me, you saw what these sensors could do, could do, and you immediately thought, wow, I can track motion in space. I'm going to build a lightsaber, you know, and, and tra track balletic <laughs> motions. Um, and, well, no, you can't, sorry. Well, anyhow, I couldn't, and I tried really hard for a couple of weeks. It turns out that, uh, you know, this is not like a Nintendo Wii, which just has multiple high-quality industrial gyroscopes in it. You know, phones have these, these, these small, much smaller, much less precise objects, and the data you're coming out is, is nowhere near accurate enough to track your position in space. And, and I would point out that, you know, the Microsoft Kinect um, actually uses a camera sitting in there to, to, to track where the, where the thing is moving and gets really, really accurate data like that. Now, there are some things you, you can do. You can very easily compute the uh, total acceleration of the device which is very, very useful in, in tracking things like shakes. And you can, you know, get general events, such as they jerked it left, they jerked it right, they jerked it up, they jerked it down, this kind of thing. Um, I found that, in, generally speaking, rotational events of, of one sort or another were easier to, to capture. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's tough stuff. Last thing I'm going to talk about is how to build a compass. There are several examples of compasses out there on the net. Uh, this is actually Anchor's code here. Um, the, the, the complicated thing is moving from device coordinates to world coordinates. And to, to do this, first of all, you have to get both the accelerometer and the magnetic field data. And then you have to do some very, uh, very scary real math to, uh, to, to, to change the coordinates. Uh, and, um, well, here's an example of that math in action. And it's actually not that hard to construct something that keeps the, the needle pointing at 
magnetic north anyhow. If you want you know, true north, you'd have to do GPS math and, and all sorts of stuff. Um, now, this is, let me backtrack. Probably the best example of sensor programming I've ever seen on an Android is something that just came out now with Jelly Bean. And this is the, what's called the compass view in the Maps app. So you get the Maps app, particularly on a device like the Nexus 7 here, and you go to a location, you go into street view, then hit the menu and, and select compass mode. And it is remarkable. You hold it like this and it, it captures the most subtle, slightest var variations in the way you hold the device and moves, pans around the view you're looking at. It is totally magical. Now that is accomplished using techniques that are probably a bit more advanced than the ones um, I talked about here. They, uh, they, they involve taking the actual rotation matrices and using quaternions and probably taking them and blasting them straight into the OpenGL code that, that is actually driving the maps. Um, the, the bad news is that you really have to be a competent mathematician who really understands this stuff in order to use that stuff, but if you really want to achieve that kind of semi-magical effect, you're going to have to do it. The good news, however, is that the library routines have been set up carefully so that the rotation matrices that come out are either 9 by 9 or 3x3 or 4x4, three three four four, and they are set up in such a way that they can be pumped directly into the OpenGL routines that want rotation matrices, and they're all just, just right, just the way you want them. So, so it's not that hard to write, assuming you know what you're doing. Okay, I think that's all I'm going to... You all know what you're doing, right? Uh, th that's all I'm going to say about motion and kinetics. You know, as Anchor showed, you know, your device can feel and see what's going on around it. And as I've been showing, you can, it can listen. As it, it, can, it, can, it can feel what you do to it as well. Now, it can do one more thing, which is listen. So, Tony, take it away. Give us audio processing. Thank you, Tim. So, besides being able to detect your motion with Android, um, Android can also listen to you through the microphone. Um, but, what if, but if I ask you as a developer, usually what, how you use the microphone, you probably will say, um, use it for voice recording or music recording, right? But what if I tell you you can use the microphone to uh, make it as a baby monitor just on this or um, a music instrument tuner or even use it to detect some inaudible frequency that only your application can understand? So a good use case of that is maybe indoor positioning. So there are a lot of interesting ways you can use the microphone. And today I'm, I want to show you um, another interesting way of using the microphone as a happy monitor. So here, let me walk you through like, uh, what, what I built. So here I have a regular staphoscope that is used by any doctor around the world. And I connect one side of the earpiece of the staphoscope to an external microphone, which is connected by um, a very sophisticated piece of connector. <laughs> Actually, I'm kidding. This is like a pencil grip. I get it online, and, but it, which fit perfectly the two ends. So the other end of the, um, the, the microphone is connected to the headphone jack of the Android device. Okay, so let me help unlock this. So I cannot talk while uh, taking the measurement, so I'll ask Anchor to help me to take the measurement. So I want to I want to walk you through uh, what the application uh, is working. Uh, That's how, dangerously how that works. high. <laughs> and <laughs> well, it pick up your your clapping, so uh, let it like settle down a little bit. So this is how the heartbeat monitor is working. So first, it takes some uh, the heartbeat sound signal from the staphoscope. And then, this is still analog, by the way. And then, the signal goes to the microphone, and then do, we do some sampling. And after that, we, I, I pass it to a low-pass filter. And then, before displaying the, the signal to, on the screen, I, I do a down sampling. So we will talk a little bit about all these steps uh, in, in the future slides. So I guess... I'll go back. Back to the slides? 
pretty excited to actually anchor today. So yeah, I get to share a stage with you guys, so I'm pretty excited, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's talk about how you can access the microphone in the, with the, uh, in the Android framework. So if you are just talking about recording some uh, sound or music uh, and encoding in, uh, in, in some common format, uh, or, uh, you, the media recorder class is what you are looking for. However, if you need to do some advanced uh, signal processing stuff, you need to access the raw data. You need to use the audio record class. And by the way, the media record class is available since day one of Android, and the audio record class is available since uh, 1.5. So before we get to, to the more technical part of the, of, the top, uh, of the session, let's start with some fundamentals so that we are on the same page. The human hearing range is between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz. And this, and this range will shrink when we get older. Well, I guess actually that's a pretty, uh, pretty nice thing because uh, suddenly all our MP3 songs uh, will, be, will sound like CD songs uh, quality <laughs> when we get older because we cannot tell the difference anymore. Um, when we talk about sound wave, there are two things we, uh, we talk about, the pitch and the loudness. So pitch is really the frequency of the sound and uh, loudness is the ampl amplitude as illustrated by the, uh, in the diagram here. One interesting property uh, thing about sound wave is it respects something called superposition principle. And this allows us to analyze like very complex signal in its like, simpler fundamental like sinusoidal components. And, and this is what enables us to do uh, what we call discrete Fourier transform, which is like the low-pass filtering stuff. So now let's, sorry, I'll skip a slide, but, uh, but that's the idea. Um, the next things I want to talk about is sampling. So team actually mentioned about sampling before, um, but this is really important, and I think uh, a lot of developer uh, didn't quite, quite get like how to pick, how to choose the right sampling rate. So I want to point out one thing um, about sampling rate is the sampling rate 44.1 kilohertz is uh, the only fre uh, frequency sam sampling rate that is uh, guaranteed to support in all Android compatible devices. However, does that mean this is the frequency you should use when you do uh, as, as a default frequency when you do sampling? Well, guess, guess what? The answer is no. And the reason is you should always understand very well your, about your signal before you choose the right frequency. Um, so, so you may ask the question, now how can I choose uh, the right frequency? Uh, it turns out the good news is there is really a rule of thumb. You always want to pick a sampling rate that is more than two times of the highest frequency component of your signal. And if you ask why, well, trust me on that one. <laughs> Actually, there are some smart people already proved that in mathematics. So if this condition is not satisfied, uh, something called aliasing will occur. And I want to show you visu visually what that means. So here I have a signal of 0.9 hertz frequency. And if I, I'm trying, I'm going to sample this signal at one hertz. So you can see there are uh, a lot of blue, blue dots on the screen, which is the sample data. So it looks okay until now I introduce another signal of 0.1 hertz, which I call the alias signal. So as you can see from the, from the graph, this alias signal fit perfectly on all the sample data you have. And this is the problem, because there's no way you can reconstruct the original signal uh, reliably if you sample your data at one hertz. So now, how to solve this problem? So let's say like I'm now instead of one hertz, I'm, tr I'm going to sample this data at two hertz, which is more than uh, two times of the original signal frequency. So now, there are more data points uh, we are capturing now, so we take a uh, sample every half a second, and as you can see, 
the alias signal no longer fit the, 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 the new sample data. And this is how we solve the problem. So another topic I want to talk about is how to choose the right buffer size. So, um, but turn out, turns out there's no one size fit all solution to that because it's really a trade off among a couple of things like uh, responsiveness and uh, memory CPU cycle, things like that. So if you choose a small buffer so you can update your UI more frequently, so that's a nice thing. Another thing is, but if you choose a large buffer, uh, you, you probably put a, a more stress to your system, um, use more memory and CPU cycle uh, per each round of operation. However, there is really a good uh, a, a plus on um, picking a big, bigger, larger buffer, which is uh, your application will be more tolerant to failure like network congestions or um, uh, resource competition with other application in the Android system. There are also a couple pitfalls I want to point out. So the, the first one is always make sure you call the get min buff, buffer side method to initialize your audio record class because this is the minimum si uh, buffer requirement to properly instantiate the audio record object. Another thing is this is also the size of a buffer that will guarantee you not dropping sample data. Another thing is when you pick the, uh, the encoding bit depth, uh, make sure you, 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 you use the right method. So if you are pick, uh, using the 8-bit encoding, use the read byte method. And if you are using the 16-bit one, make sure you use the restart method. Trust me, that will save you from a lot of trouble. So now let's get to uh, signal processing. So when will you usually do like signal processing? So there are a couple of things. So the first one is if you want to filter some noises. And I would like to show you a quick demo like what we can achieve um, by doing adding a filter to a signal. Cool. So let's turn the filter off right now. So you can see there are a very strong signal right here. And if I turn on the filter, you can see immediately the, uh, the signal go away besides my voice. So that quickly illustrates how a low pass filter works. Um, another use case for doing signal processing is if you want to do some spectral analysis on your, on your signal. Um, but one thing about uh, processing, like doing this kind of signal processing is it's really, really hard to do it in the time domain. So I have to um, diagram here that represent the same signal but in a different format, one in time domain and one in the frequency domain. So um, as you can see, in the time domain, there, there isn't really much uh, things you can do to, to decompo uh, decomponentize your signal. But on the other hand, in the frequency domain, you can find it very easy to see individual components uh, represent uh, your, your signal. So that's, what, uh, that's why peop a lot of people are doing all these like, low-pass filtering in the, in, the, in the frequency domain. Now the question is, how can you transform your your signal from the time domain to the, to the frequency domain. And I have another good news for you. So someone already, already figured this out. So it's what we call the discrete Fourier transform. And this is a math. So when we talk about DFT, it, it's really a computing intensive operation. So the complexity of DFT is really n squared. However, in practice, thanks to some computer scientists, uh, we already figured out another more efficient algorithm to achieve the same result, which is fast forward transform, FFT. And the complexity of that is n log n. So, but even that, when you implement the FFT, uh, you can choose to use some library, but if you, but it's not really a, a, lot, of, a, long, uh, a lot of code. 
But if you really implement uh, FFT, there are a couple of things you want to look, look out for. The first thing is, of course, garbage collection. So I saw some implementation of FFT using, using a, uh, a Java object to represent a complex data value. That's really expensive because if you are talking about sampling your data at 44.1 kilohertz, you're talking about creating like 40,000 objects for every single second, so which is totally inefficient. So in my demo, instead of using a, um, a Java object to represent a complex data value, I'm using two arrays of primitive, double primitive, uh, to store the complex data value. So one for the real, num uh, the real part of the, of the number and another part for the imaginary, imaginary one. Another thing when you, when you uh, write your methods, um, consider doing something called uh, in-place algorithm, if, if possible. If your algor algorithm can, can do that, do it, because you can save a lot of memory. So basically what that does is uh, you, we use the input, data, uh, the input array to store the output of your results. And finally, if your computation is really complex, um, you, always, you can always consider using the NDK. So now, it's relatively easy to get data, uh, sens sensor data from Android. However, it's quite challenging to really making sense out of the data. So as uh, Tim and Anker pointed out earlier. So I, I would like to share some tips with you on how to really understand or interpret data. Um, so the first one is using thresholds. Um, in team and Anker uh, co snapper uh, uh, snipper earlier, there we, we, we use in a lot of places using uh, threshold to extract useful information from the, from the sensor, sensor data. And in my happy demo, I, I also use that in a couple places. Uh, the first one is I use that to detect peaks, uh, happy peaks, uh, to, to, in order to calculate the happy rate. Um, another, another place I use that is I, I use that to, uh, to filter out some peaks that are too close to each other. And the third place I use this is I, uh, because I don't want uh, the happy rate to fluctuate too, uh, too quickly, so I, I use some threshold criteria to, um, to, to determine uh, only if the happy rate repeat like um, X number of time, then I, I, I update the UI. So, so threshold is really uh, useful when you handle, uh, when, you, when, you, when you are handling sensor data. Another thing is time. Um, in my heartbeat demo, I'm using time combining with the sensor data to calculate the heartbeat rate. Finally, statistics are your friend when you handle um, sensor data because sensor data are inherently noisy and messy, as Tim mentioned. Um, it's always good to use some basic statistics to interpret and understand your data. And in my heartbeat um, demo, I used uh, something called weighted moving average uh, to control the, uh, the, how sensitive uh, the, the heartbeat detection algorithm. So it turns out it works pretty well. So after you get all the data, so you, you, you want to display them to your user, right? So the Android, framework comes with um, a visualizer uh, in the audio ethics package. However, there are a couple of caveats. So the first thing is, in order to use this visualizer, uh, the, the visualizer only applies to um, a current playing audio track. So in other words, like in my example, since I'm not playing the heartbeat sound, so I cannot use the, the, the visualizer comes with uh, the Android framework. So I have to build my own custom visualizer. But when you have to do a, a build a custom visualizer, there are a couple of things you need to remember. First of all, you have to downsample your data. Because um, on, this, on, on, on any like, phone screen, you probably only have like 12, 80 pixels, right? But you definitely have a lot more data points when you do sampling. So make sure you have to downsample your data. And probably it's a good idea to uh, pass your, uh, your data through a low pass filter before doing the downsample. Um, if you want to achieve that horizontal, horizontal scrolling effect of, um, uh, on, on the UI I have, um, you also 
want to use a circular buffer to keep track of your data. So, so that's pretty much I want to talk ab uh, about audio. And I hope you guys find it useful and um, really look forward to see some more exciting way of using the microphone in your application uh, in, in Google Play. So I'll pass the stage back to Tim. All right. Thank you, Tony. So um, check that link there. That's where our organization, the Developer Relations Organization, puts our training materials. As of yet, there's not actually a course on sensors there yet, but there will be real soon now as a consequence of, of having done this session. And uh, you know, it, it's a super valuable resource for anybody who's trying to be an Android developer. So a housekeeping note and a, and a takeaway. Housekeeping note is we're kind of low on time already, so we're not, I don't think we're going to really be able to do much in the way of questions here. We're all going to go from here straight up to the Android uh, office hours on the third floor. And if you want to talk about sensors or anything else, come on up and find us there, and we can relax and talk. Final point I want to make is it's hard to stand out. There's a lot of apps up there in Google Play. Not many people are doing the sensor stuff. This could be the hook that makes your app stand out from the big, big, big crowd. Thank you. <laughs>